and welcome to the LLG Grapevine podcast. You're listening to Helen Bennett, LLG's Executive Director of Policy and Governance, and Dennis Hall, LLG Bulletin Editor. Hello, everyone. Well, now, Dennis, last week saw the King's speech, and I watched with intent interest, and I'm sure many of our listeners did as well. Some encouraging elements, I thought, but still a lot of questions. Dennis, you've taken a particular look at this too. Well, yes, of course, it's the big news of the week. This huge legislative programme that's set out in the King's speech, which in the end turned out to be over 40 bills, predicted to be 30, 35, but over 40. And with this overriding mission, ambition, to create economic growth, that's what's at the heart of it. Now, this is one of the biggest programmes in recent history, and it's important to us because of two things. At its heart are devolution and planning reform. But the overall scale of the proposals is wide ranging and potentially enormous. Helen, I'll look at this in two parts here in the grapevine and in the accompanying vlog, you and I will both take a deep dive into the devolution revolution as Angela Rayner has described it. So here's my first piece on the topic of devolution. The English devolution bill was yet another much expected measure intended to extend devolution as a default setting across England and giving the opportunity for extra powers for mayors and local authorities. The bill aims to establish a new framework for English devolution, moving power out of Westminster and back to local areas. Its main five elements are, first, putting a more ambitious standardised devolution framework into legislation to give local leaders greater powers over the levers of local growth. This will include enhanced powers over strategic planning, local transport networks, skills and employment support, thereby enabling them to create jobs and improve living standards. We will, the government said, also introduce new powers and duties for local leaders to produce local growth plans. Second, the bill intends to make devolution the default setting, meaning that places will be granted powers without the need to negotiate agreements where they meet the governance conditions. And local leaders will be able to formally request additional powers according to the framework, and the government will be required to consider the request and either devolve them or publicly explain their reasons for not doing so. Third, the bill intends to make it easier to provide devolved powers quickly to more areas through establishing a simpler process for creating new combined and combined county authorities to ensure that every part of England can rapidly benefit from devolution. The bill will establish a legislative foundation upon which to widen and deepen devolution, with a weighting towards creating advanced mayoral settlements where there is a capacity and ambition to do so. Fourth, the bill is set on improving and unblocking local decision making through more effective governance arrangements, ensuring mayors and combined authorities can get on and deliver for their areas. Fifth and finally, the bill is set to empower local communities with a strong new right to buy for valued community assets, such as empty shops, pubs, and community spaces. And this will help to revamp high streets and end the blight of empty premises. And Helen and I will take a closer look at the devolution proposals in the accompanying vlog. Helen. Yes, we will, Dennis. So let's leave devolution there for the time being and step away from uh, for a moment from the King's speech and look at the letter from the Association of Electoral Administrators to the Deputy Prime Minister, Angela Rayner. Of course, Rayner is also our Secretary of State. In the letter, Peter Stanion, CEO, calls for an independent royal or parliamentary commission review of core electoral delivery processes, stating that, quote, our current system is difficult to understand and navigate. Recent changes have bolted 21st century user experiences onto 19th century infrastructure, too often leaving electors frustrated or disappointed. Now, of course, within the King's speech, we did hear a commitment to strengthening the integrity of elections and encourage wide participation in the democratic process. Incidentally, the Association of Democratic 
uh, officers and LLG are hoping that the democratic participation element will support our cause and others to have specific remote meeting provision for local authorities. And we have jointly written ourselves to Angela Rayner regarding this, and we will publish that letter this week on our website. And uh, for as no, ad so listeners, that will be available on their website too. Uh, but back to the AEA letter. Other requirements and points that are addressed uh, within that letter are as follows. The need for a single electoral administration act, which represents devolved nations differences. The need for an extended 30 working day election timetable for all polls up from the 25 working days currently in place. The need to grant returning officers the discretion to replace lost or undelivered postal votes earlier than four working days before a poll and expanding the emergency proxy criteria. And consideration on how national electoral communications can be improved to help manage expectations at future polls. The other red flag raised by the AEA concerned the move to a GB-wide digital system they believed caused a variety of unattended issues, including duplicate registrations, which were estimated to be around one third of the 2.9 million UK PGE applications. Obviously, that takes a lot of resource to deal with. They also highlighted issues of overseas electors applying for postal votes on deadline day supplier capacity and electors bringing non-compliant photo ID to polling stations, leading to an increase in abuse and intimidation. Now, at LLG, we have great respect for the work that the AEA, AEA does, and we thank them for everything they're trying to do to improve the electoral process. Dennis. So, back to the King's speech. Let's summarise those key provisions on the, on the question of planning reform that are central to the government's plans. Next, the Planning and Infrastructure Bill. And this is one of the government's flagship measures intended to streamline and speed up planning measures plus associated infrastructure needs to get more housing built. And it includes a more top-down approach. Now, the bill will make improvements to the planning system at a local level modernising planning committees and increasing local planning authorities' capacity to deliver an improved service. The new bill will streamline the delivery process for critical infrastructure, including accelerating upgrades to the national grid and boosting renewable energy, which will benefit local communities, unlock delivery of the government's 2030 clean power mission and net zero obligations, and secure domestic energy security. The government says, we will simplify the consenting process for major infrastructure projects and enable relevant, new and improved national policy statements to come forward, establishing a review process that provides the opportunity for them to be updated every five years, giving increased certainty to developers and communities. The bill also plans to reform compulsory purchase compensation rules to ensure that compensation paid to landowners is fair but not excessive where important social and physical infrastructure and affordable housing are being delivered. The reforms, the government says, will help unlock more sites for development, enabling more effective land assembly, and in doing so, speeding up house building and delivering more affordable housing and supporting the public interest. And the government also say that they will improve local planning decision-making by modernising planning committees. The bill plans to increase local planning authorities' capacity to improve performance and decision-making, providing a more predictable service to developers and investors. The bill will use development to fund nature recovery where currently both are stalled, unlocking a win-win outcome for the economy and for nature. And the government says on this that their commitment to the environment is unwavering which is why the government will work with nature delivery organisations, stakeholders and the sector over the summer to determine the best way forward. Now, as more detail emerges on all of this, we will, of course, report further on the provisions of the new bill. Helen. Well, absolutely, Dennis. Now, the Environment Secretary, Steve Reid, has announced a series of initial steps towards ending the crisis in the water sector. 
But the Information Commissioner has called for water companies to be crystal clear with public over sewage pollution, stating in a letter that water companies must put transparency first if they want to rebuild public trust. Now, the ICO wrote to 12 water companies, calling on them to be as transpa transparent as possible with their customers. The letter encourages water companies to proactively disclose information relating to sewage discharges on a monthly basis, providing more efficient and timely details to the public, as well as being more cost effective for the water companies, they say. Now, water companies are, of course, obliged to release environmental information under the Environmental Information Regulations 2004, both proactively and if requested by the public. Now, the Information Commissioner, John Edwards, made this call following a recent tribunal finding, which found that a legal exception, which says releasing information will prejudice an investigation, did not apply to the requested information. It also follows, of course, the ongoing pressures being faced by water companies over sewage pollution. So let's just take a look at that case very quickly. So this is the matter of Stephen Lavelle and the Information Commissioner and others involving Northumbrian Water Group Limited, where the tribunal held as follows, that they did not consider um, Northumbrian Water Group were entitled to rely on Regulation 12, Subsection 5, Subsection B of the Environmental Information Regulations. Let's remind ourselves what that is. That's a regulation um, which allows to refuse disclosure information, quote, to the extent that its disclosure would adversely affect the course of justice, uh, the ability of a person to receive a fair trial, or the ability of a public authority to conduct an inquiry of a criminal or disciplinary nature. Um, and of course, the public interest uh, favours disclosure, but that exemption um, is applied. So the tribunal didn't didn't uh, agree at all with that. Um, and they, they also did not consider that the water company was entitled to rely on Regulation 12, Subsection 4, Subsection A, and that's being, it, it does not hold the information at the point at which an application's request is received. Um, which I found to be interesting to be relied on by the water company. But that's uh, it's it, it's a really interesting case. It's, it's definitely worth a read if you advise on EIR, DPA or FOI, because that, that exemption um, about affecting the course of justice is, is quite an important one. And there's quite a lot in that judgment um, that petitioners need to be aware of um, if they're thinking of relying on that exemption. So, Dennis, back to the new government for you. Uh, yes. Another important aspect of the new government, of course, is the tone that has been set by the Prime Minister, a commitment to high standards in government and probity in decision making, combined with a commitment to public service. Now, the Prime Minister has been very quick to take some initial steps on this important issue. Here's more on this. The Prime Minister has promised to beef up the powers of his ministerial standards watchdog. Sir Keir Starmer said he wants to allow Sir Laurie Magnus, his independent advisor on ministers' interests, to initiate his own investigations rather than beginning them only after a request from number 10. Critics have long believed that the independent advisor was relatively toothless because previously they could not look into potential wrongdoing by a minister without the prime minister asking them to do so. Sir Laurie's two predecessors resigned during Boris Johnson's time as Prime Minister. Labour committed in its manifesto to setting up a new independent ethics and integrity commission to ensure probity in government. It claimed trust in politics has been shattered during the Conservative years in office, citing the parties that happened during the pandemic when large gatherings were banned. The scope and remit of this new commission, however, is not yet clear, and the government are yet to announce how it will work in practice, or indeed whether it will cover standards and ethics in local government, as well as in Parliament. Sir Keir spoke to Sir Laurie on his first day in Downing Street to have a discussion with him about standards and the enforcement of standards. The Prime Minister said the importance of this had been impressed upon his ministers too. I was really clear, he said, with the cabinet that standards apply. 
I made it clear how the ministerial code will apply and that they will be receiving a copy of it, and it will have the Nolan principles inside and alongside it. However, at this stage, there is no indication here that local government standards and ethics are on the new government's agenda, nor any indication in their manifesto that there will be any tightening of sanctions in cases involving councillors. We shall have to wait and see. Helen. Well, we will continue to push for sanctions, Dennis, because of course that has long been on our campaign drive. Now, on a completely different change of topic, I was going to talk about the Equality and Human Rights Commission's consultation on updating its technical guidance on sexual harassment and sexual harassment at work to take into account the Worker Protection Amendment of Equality Act 2010 Act 2023. And this comes into force on the 26th of October. October, but I will refer you to the bulletin for that and instead discuss, discuss something else which caught my eye, um, a, a different consultation, and this is the Law Commission's consultation on contempt of court. As the majority of listeners will know, contempt of court at present refers to a wide variety of conduct that may impede or interfere with the administration of justice. For example, taking photographs in a courtroom, making an audio recording of proceedings, assaulting court staff or witnesses and refusing to answer a court's question if called as a witness. It may also be committed by conduct that occurs elsewhere, for instance, by journalists, bloggers or members of the public publishing material that risks prejudicing a trial or publishing in breach of reporting restrictions. The Commission argues uh, that, quote, a clearer and more co coherent set of laws and rules governing contempt, addressing liability for contempt, the powers of courts, procedure and the imposition of sanctions, would help to ensure that this very significant area of law operates in a principled, comprehensive and effective way. Now, the consultation picks up the tensions between freedom of expression and right to a fair trial and the current disparate contempt common law and case law. And one of the main proposals is to create a new framework for liability where there would be three distinct forms of contempt. And these are general contempt, contempt by breach of order or undertaking, and contempt by publication when proceedings are active. It's really quite interesting, quite quite revolutionary. Um, the Commission says that, that this will be necessary, these three types, to ensure that an appropriate balance is struck between the protection of fair trial rights on the one hand and rights to freedom of expression on the other. And what those various rights and protections require of content, contempt will be different, depending, of course, on the context and nature of the conduct. The considerations that relate to publication of court proceedings are clearly different, they point out, from those that relate to assault in court or breach of a court order. So the thrust of these reforms, I believe, comes from the increasing use of social media and the electronic sharing of information. It's it's long overdue since the last review um, in, of contempt of court was held back in, in 2012, and I'm not sure um, much happened at that point. So the deadline for responses to this consultation is the 8th of November. So that's a, a good long lead in for that. Um, and I would urge uh, members to take a look at it and respond um, if they feel that they, they should do. And on that note, you can read more on the items discussed today and many more besides by going to bulletin number 26 available on the LLG website now. So it's goodbye from me. And from me too.